take it from the ground, mother. I've been round, I've been round, I've been round. Yeah, take it from the ground. Okay, Demons of the Punjab is the sixth episode of Series 11 of Doctor Who, written by Vinay Patel, directed by Jamie Childs. I think Demons of the Punjab was an incredible piece of television. See, I try to judge things based on one criteria and one criteria alone. How well did this piece of art succeed at being the thing it wanted to be? On that front, yeah, 10 out of 10 would watch again. It was moving, it showed us a bit of history a lot of people don't know much about, especially over here in America. It made me think about families and the lives of our ancestors and the lives of our grandparents and the stories that get passed down from generation to generation. It said, yeah, you know what? We're gonna do the meet your ancestors in the past thing and it's not gonna be so, uh, you know, uh, white this time. It kept the perspective so small and intimate it honestly could have been a stage play. Whatever problems the Tasmanian Capaldi or whatever the last week's episode had, uh, Demons of the Punjab didn't. Every element in this story was relevant to telling this story. Yeah, even the demons. Boom, I said it. Yaz receives a broken watch from her grandmother, Umbreen. Yaz's sister, Sonia, gets something nifty too, but since Yaz is the favorite granddaughter and Sonia is clearly the Meg Griffin of the Khan family, she gets the broken watch given to Granny on her wedding day. It's also a clever way of giving the rest of the episode additional poignancy. Yaz wants to know more, and so do we. So Yaz persuades the doctor to take everyone back to 1947 to see her grandmother's wedding, and when Umbreen became the first woman married in Pakistan. The doctor doesn't want to at first because Father's Day, but ah, oh, what the heck, what's a little butterfly effect between friends, am I right? They happen to run into this guy named Prem. We're actually looking for a woman by the name of Umbreen. Right, Umbreen. Ah, uh, okay, good. They meet an old man along the way who has some long forgotten words, but strangely no ancient melodies. Wanna ride with us, Adu? I can take one more. What's wrong with your feet? You young people. Always such a rush. This is the holy man who's officiating the wedding, the guy who agreed to marry a Muslim girl and a Hindu guy, which at this point in history is uh, kind of not a thing that's supposed to happen. We instantly like him too. So clearly, he's doomed. Prem being framed as the 1947 version of a millennial means we're going to take a shine to him before we learn that he's A, marrying Yaz's grandma, and 2, not the guy Yaz remembers as her grandfather. Extremely efficient storytelling. They've arrived on a very important day. It's not just Umbreen's wedding, it's also Partition Day, the day the Brits split up India and Pakistan. And what a fun coincidence. The border happens to run right through their front yard. India, Pakistan. It's not just the land that gets divided. Rioting in the cities. Tens of millions of people about to be displaced. More than a million about to die. We know this because Prem's brother Manish knows this. This is another thing the script does well. We actually like this kid when we meet him too. Prem is Hindu and so is his brother, but as we learn, his brother's kind of an extremist Hindu and doesn't like that Prem is marrying a Muslim girl. Prem isn't Yaz's grandfather, but this is the day Pakistan becomes a country and Yaz's grandmother was the first woman married in Pakistan and you can see where this is going. Now I can imagine this tragic love story would resonate with people all over the world. I can think the Middle East and Ireland, the Czech Republic, uh, Germany, wherever. The fact that they happen to have chosen the Punjab as a setting is simultaneously important because representation is good and also kind of not that important at all because yeah this is specifically a story about the history of India and Pakistan but it's also not dissimilar from other stories set in Belfast and Central America and so on. The knock-on effects of sectarianism and imperialism and fundamentalism and how the problems of two crazy kids in love don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. It's Romeo and Juliet. It's a tale as old as time, unfortunately. But that universality kind of disproves any idiots who think Doctor Who might be doing this only for diversity's sake. 
I'm almost tempted to pull out that old social justice card about how not everything has to be made for you, dude. Except, nah, this story was totally made for them. But they're not gonna like why. There is, of course, an actual monster here in the traditional sense. They're galactic assassins who have no business being here in Lahore on August 17th, 1947. Prem remembers seeing them on the battlefield back during uh, WW2 standing over his brother. And the doctor and friends find them standing over that nice holy man and think, yep, they killed him. And yet, as we learn, these guys are nice assassins. They're atoning for their sins by traveling the universe, honoring the dead and forgotten. They're here to honor the dead, nothing more. And they know what's about to happen. They also know what happened to the holy man. There is a theme emerging this season, that the real monsters aren't the Daleks or the Cybermen, it's PEOPLE! Now, of course, we all know that the reason most of the monsters on Doctor Who and elsewhere are so frightening is because they reflect the most negative aspects of humanity in some way. The Daleks were based on the Nazis, and the Cybermen have a shocking disregard for bodily autonomy and individual rights. What's truly monstrous isn't, I want to hurt you, it's, I don't care about you. You're less than human. Your opinions don't matter. You matter less than me. I got mine. And for most of human history, the definition of what quote unquote makes someone a man is, well, how much of a cyberman can you be if we ask you to? How much of someone's bodily autonomy are you prepared to disregard? What would it take to make you hurt someone? Would they have to threaten your family? Well, okay, because, hey, see those guys over there? They want to hurt your family. Don't ask questions. They're everywhere. Don't ask questions. One of them might even be in your family right now. What does Prem say again? His brother spends too much time reading pamphlets and listening to angry men on the radio? Well, ain't that how all kinds of folks get radicalized now, isn't it? Manish wasn't old enough to fight the war, and now he has to prove himself by joining the anti-Muslim Hindu nationalists because we can't stop feeding boys lies, now can we? We set high expectations and then call them worthless when they don't live up, and so they lash out and they look for their own battle. And if there's no battlefield, that anger festers and leaks out, and that's how angry men on the radio steal their souls. And Manish killed the sweet holy man who was going to officiate the wedding between his own brother and his childhood friend. A Hindu man and a Muslim woman, because their union disgusts him, because men on the radio told him it should, and he's never had a war, and now he does, and he can prove himself. Yeah, you're a real man now, buddy. The story hinges on the fact that the doctor can't save Prem, that everyone knows that he has to die, but they have to go through the motions anyway, and this genuinely is moving. And it has to happen. And all the doctor and friends can do is walk away. And this is kind of my one problem with this episode. See, it'd be easy to say The Demons of the Punjab is a bold and innovative take on the historical genre, if for no other reason than the fact that the story's central tragedy literally has to happen or it puts one of the main characters' lives in danger, right? It would cause her to disappear forever. So things have to play out as they're going to play out, and it sucks, and it hurts, but them's the breaks sometimes with time travel. And the problem is, it's in the same season as Rosa, and Arachnids in the UK, and I'm seeing a pattern. And since it's pretty obvious, the show is trying to make a very timely and important statement this year about empathy and humanity, I'm not sure if the show's really saying the thing it thinks it's saying. On its own, the episode was beautiful, moving, all that stuff. But the fact that this is the third episode this year where the Doctor has to just walk away is kind of frustrating. I mean, in every individual case it makes sense. Like I said in the Rosa video, you can't have the Doctor inspiring Rosa Parks, nor can you have her preventing Rosa Parks from being arrested and ending racism forever. And the same thing applies here, even though it's a smaller tragedy against the backdrop of a larger one, because it means Yaz would vanish from existence. Putting two very similar fixed point in time narratives in the same season is tricky. And it gets trickier when they essentially do the same thing in Arachnids in the UK by letting all the spiders live. I mean, 
someone's gonna stumble on that hotel and die, man. And as both Nathaniel from Council of Geeks and El Sandifer from the Erudatorum have pointed out, I'm not sure 2018 is really the best time for the show to consistently, accidentally, but consistently make the point that, hey, you know, sometimes you shouldn't be proactive in the face of injustice and cruelty. My problem isn't with the doctor making the choice to walk away, she sort of had to. It's about the series consistently putting her in that position, time and time again, where she has to walk away. I get it, the most monstrous creature in the universe is mankind and so on and so forth, and the show's saying some good stuff in individual moments, and we need to face the cruel cold facts of history and admit our failures, but sometimes you just want to believe that there are things that can be fixed. And there has to be something more we can do other than shake our heads and walk away. I mean, unless the thing the season is actually building up to is the Doctor having a massive crisis of confidence and just turning into the meddling monk out of spite, which would be fascinatingly unwise, but I'd get a kick out of talking about it. Ah!